Football is not just a game, but a tapestry of cultures, rules, and histories. Football is a term that resonates with diverse meanings around the globe. From its origins as a, as a simple game of kicking a ball, football has evolved into various forms, each with its unique identity and fan base. And so today, I want to explore the evolution of football, unfolding the story of how the singular idea diverged into seven distinct codes, each a world of its own. I want to mention here at the beginning, it's really easy to fall into the trap of dismissing football cultures that are unfamiliar. Growing up with a particular form of football often instills a uh, deep-rooted passion and loyalty for that version of the game. This cultural and emotional attachment can sometimes lead to a narrow view, underestimating the significance and beauty of other forms of football. But it's essential to recognize that just as one cherishes their favorite version of the sport, imbued with personal memories and cultural connections, so do fans of other football codes. In every corner of the world, football, in its varied forms, evokes the same fervor, and nostalgic remembrance. These experiences are united by a common thread of joy, community, and even cultural identity. This universal language of emotion and passion transcends boundaries and cultures, uh, binding fans of all football codes in a, a shared love of sport. So, as we journey through the history and evolution of these seven distinct forms of football, let us embrace the rich diversity and remember that each version holds a special place in the hearts of its followers, just as your version does for you. Football as we know it evolved from ball games played by students at British public schools in the early 1800s. These games are characterized by its variety and roughness, with rules varying significantly from one institution to another. During this time, the games were about strength, endurance, and local customs. Most football matches were played between the different houses at the school, amongst a body of students that knew their school's particular flavor of football. But this era's lack of standardized rules did lead to challenges in football matches between schools. This often resulted in confusion, disagreements, and a rough, chaotic style of play. But as we moved into the middle part of the 19th century, significant efforts were underway to begin standardizing the game's rules. This movement was driven by many events and key figures, but would eventually be swayed and fractured by the differences and acceptances among various schools and their football cultures. One of the first largely successful attempts at standardization among schools was born out of the student meetings at Cambridge University in 1848. These students were from various public schools, including Harrow, Rugby, Eton, and Shrewsbury. And out of these meetings came the Cambridge Rules. Then about a decade later, in 1857, one of the world's oldest still existent football clubs was established, the Sheffield Football Club. Their own set of custom rules brought innovations to the game by introducing such things as free kicks for fouls, uh, the idea of corner kicks, and a specific player protecting the goal. Then a few years later, in 1863, the Football Association was formed. With their formation, the association published their set of laws. Thus was born Association Football, known by many around the world as just football, or as soccer in areas with more popular forms of football. Soccer literally being just a shortened word for association. Now a thing to point out as I continue. Once governing bodies were formed and given the power to make changes to how the game was played, the word rule became less common and the word law began to take shape. But during this early period, you will find references to both rules and laws. Now, from the publication of the Football Association laws until 1877, the FA and Sheffield rule sets coexisted and even influenced each other during this time. 
Sheffield eventually voted to join the Football Association. However, not all schools were aligned with the Football Association's idea of what the game should look like. Now, most notably, rugby school and any clubs that played their game. The game as played at rugby allowed for handling the ball, carrying it as he ran, and physical tackling. This obviously diverged significantly from the FA's vision. So, when the FA formed in 1863, clubs that played the rugby style refused to join. Just a few years earlier, in 1856, an Australian by the name of Tom Wills returned to his home nation after having spent time at rugby school. His first love was cricket, but he thoroughly enjoyed rugby football as well. In 1858, during the cricket off-season, Wills had a letter published that sparked the creation of what is now known as Australian Rules Football. He was seeking a way to stay fit during the winter downtime, and it wasn't long before a set of rules and some football clubs were formed, the first being the Melbourne Football Club on May 14, 1859. Though inspired by his time at rugby, they didn't want to replicate the game in full. And it wasn't long before Australia had a similar problem to the English. Each local club had its own version of football. It took until 1866 for everyone to agree to play with an updated version of the Melbourne rules, but another 11 years, 1877, for the Victoria Football Association to be formed. Back in England, the rugby clubs that refused to join the FA also had issues with too many local variants. A letter published in The Times, a British daily national newspaper from London, requested that any clubs that played the rugby-style game should meet to form a code as, quote, various clubs play to rules which differ from others, which makes the game difficult to play. In response to that letter, in early 1871, 21 clubs met in London and created the Rugby Football Union. The first laws of rugby were approved later in June of that year. Around this time, rugby and association football was becoming popular in Ireland as well. And in Southwest Ireland, another type of football resembling the Australian kind was spreading. The popularity of these sports were beginning to overtake what little was left of the traditional sports that were previously played there. In order to secure the future of Irish football, the Gaelic Athletic Association was formed in 1884. Established not only to promote traditional Irish sports, but to prevent the encroachment of English sports. The first official GAA rules of Gaelic football were published in 1887. Old Irish mob football was soon forgotten, and a collection of rules gathered from various sources was codified. A blend of both association and rugby elements, but with a healthy dose of features found in the Australian game, like the allowance of both kicking and hand passing the ball. Gaelic football was more than just a sport. It became a symbol of Irish identity and cultural pride, particularly significant during a time of nationalistic fervor in Ireland. The sport's development was closely tied to the Irish struggle for independence and the desire to preserve native cultural practices in the face of British influence. On the North American side of things, early codes of the association football style were beginning to take shape at university campuses across the United States and Canada. Though the same problem existed on this side of the ocean as well. Each school and club had a slightly different version of football in mind. Playing a match required an agreement beforehand on what the rules would be. In 1864 at Trinity College, a new set of rules based on the rugby game were written up. A group of clubs were formed around these rules and became moderately popular, known as Canadian rugby at the time. The game eventually developed unique features such as a, a larger field, 12 players per team, and distinct scoring methods. A few universities also picked up on this style, most importantly for the American game, McGill University in Montreal. In the United States, football was beginning to take hold in the late 1860s. The first NCAA officially recognized game of college football is the Princeton at Rutgers game of November 6th, 1869. Now this is classified under college football. The game was much more similar to association football. 
Rutgers won six goals to four. In 1873, representatives from Yale, Columbia, Princeton, and Rutgers had met to codify the rules that they would use moving forward. Harvard, though invited, decided not to attend. They preferred their own version of football. So, much like their rugby brethren, they decided to go out on their own. However, unlike the rugby teams, there was no one else playing their version, called the Boston game. But this would turn out to be a footnote in history, because later in 1873, McGill University sent a challenge to Harvard, a two-game series between the Canadian and American universities. The first game was played under Harvard's Boston game rules, but the second game, the next day, would be under McGill's rugby-style rules. There wasn't a looking back. Harvard quickly dropped the Boston game and began playing rugby. Significant figures like Walter Camp, known as the father of American football, began playing a crucial role in the evolution of the game. Camp introduced such changes as uh, the line of scrimmage and the system of downs, eventually the allowance of interference or blocking, and the forward pass made American football truly its own game. And these changes transformed the rugby-like game into a distinct sport, with strategic play and team formations at its core. The Canadian game evolved in parallel with the American game, beginning with the adoption of the Burnside rules, a give and take on concepts and rules that make the two sports similar in many ways. It wasn't until the 1940s that the Canadian game would even be called football consistently. Prior to this, the sport was known as rugby in Canada, or Canadian rugby. Rugby from overseas was known as English rugby. The final development in the creation of the seven codes of football was the split within the Rugby Football Union. The split was not a divergence in playing styles at the time, but a reflection of deeper social and economic disagreements within the sport. See, rugby had grown in popularity across Britain, but by the late 19th century, tensions arose regarding player compensations and professionalism. Clubs in the north of England, where the sport was popular among working class players, favored allowing compensation for time off work due to matches. Southern clubs, rooted in amateurism and middle to upper class values, staunchly opposed this idea. The rugby football union was committed to the amateur status of the sport, prohibiting any form of player payment. Clubs from the north of England, frustrated with the stance on amateurism, broke away to form the Northern Rugby Football Union, which was later renamed Rugby Football League in 1922. This new organization allowed players to be compensated, leading to the professionalization of the game in these areas. Now, initially, both Rugby Union and Rugby League played under similar rules, but over time, Rugby League introduced changes to make the game faster and more spectator-friendly. This split was more than a sporting disagreement. It reflected broader social and class divisions in British society. Rugby Union continued to be associated with the middle and upper classes, while Rugby League became a symbol of working class strength and professionalism. Both codes developed distinct identities and cultures. The split is just another pivotal chapter in the history of football, uh, another great example of how social, economic, and cultural factors can influence the development of sports. This division not only changed the landscape of rugby as a whole, but also reflected the changing times taking place in Britain. And that is the history of football and how it led to seven distinct codes. In alphabetical order, so no one can claim favoritism on my part. American, Association, Australian, Canadian, Gaelic, Rugby League, and Rugby Union. And now before this video becomes far too long, I'll wrap it up here. The 1800s were an important time in the development of all the codes of football that we know today. They all can find their birth in the public schools of England, 
I mean, even Gaelic football with its development and codification put in place as a way to stop British influence. And truthfully, this has only been a shallow look at a rich and layered topic, and much of the nuanced history has faded into the past, but there remains a wealth of knowledge to be discovered about the evolution of these sports. For those of us with a passion of both history and sports, the journey of these games from their rudimentary origins to beloved modern-day spectacles we both watch and play is endlessly fascinating. At least to me.